Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Mark Andrzejczyk. I administer the Ukrainian Studies Program here at the Harriman Institute, Columbia University. Um, thank you so much for joining us now uh, for what I think is a very important panel uh, in this crucial time uh, of war. Uh, the panel is entitled Ukrainian Artists Respond to War. And of course, uh, Ukrainian-Russian war has been going on since 2014, and Ukrainian artists have been responding in the past eight years in, in, in very interesting, innovative, uh, deep ways uh, in film, in music, in literature, in visual art. And there have been conferences about this. We had one here. There's a journal coming out, uh, a scholarly journal assessing these works, um, lots of books. So it's really... Uh, made an imprint the war has on Ukrainian culture. Uh, but now, of course, as the war has intensified in the last two weeks, uh, we hope today to talk about uh, the ways that these artists, these Ukrainian creative people are dealing with the war today uh, as individuals, as citizens, as, as artists. And we have an esteemed panel of, of experts on this. And I'm so grateful to all of you for joining. Kind of, we put this together at the last second. Um, I will introduce each speaker before they speak. Uh, and then after all four speakers have, have, have presented, uh, we'll have a chance for uh, questions. Please pose your questions in the Q&A tab and I'll uh, read them to our guests. Uh, our event today is from 12 to one. Uh, so I wanna get started because we have lots to talk about, I'm sure. Um, our first speaker is Olena Martiniuk. Uh, she is an art historian with an interest in art theory and philosophy. Her research focuses on Ukrainian and Russian art from the late 20th century to the present. She graduated with a PhD in art history from Rutgers, Rutgers University in January, 2018. She is presently uh, the Petra Yatsik postdoctoral research scholar in Ukrainian studies at our Harriman Institute, Columbia University, Olena. Uh, thank you, Marco, for, for this introduction. And uh, uh, thank you for inviting me to participate in this, um, uh, as you said, uh, urgently put panel. And uh, uh, I feel a very strong obligation to do so, even though we are all definitely being uh, truly overwhelmed by uh, the current war and um, I am uh, like my family and um, my very close friends right now in Kiev and uh, so this past several weeks we're at this constant monitoring the news and constant checking on their well-being so uh, <clears throat> perhaps uh, this presentation will, would not be uh, a completely this ordinarily ordinary scholarly uh, talk, but I will try to make uh, some uh, intro and then I will show uh, some images um, uh, of very kind of raw responses to the war in their variety. Uh, let me let me start by sharing my uh, PowerPoint screen. Um, Um, uh, so, do, do you see my PowerPoint? Okay, thank you. Yes. Um, so, a war is primarily perceived uh, through images uh, and um, traditionally, especially photographs. Uh, their staging or dramaturgy became pretty conventional in modern epoch, as Susan, Susan Zontek so convincingly demonstrated in her book regarding the pain of others. The starting point being actually the Crimean War of 1853-1856, uh, the first war uh, captured um, in photos. Uh, since then, multitude uh, modes of representing war uh, were in the making until our days when a spectacle of war became a customary element of the TV home entertainment, uh, consumed by ordinary citizens who developed certain numbness to the events they see in media. 
Uh, despite the visual saturation of the war narrative with canonical imagery, it was theorized by numerous philosophers, uh, Jacques Rancière among them, how in fact war, uh, war leaves the representation in ruins, similarly to how it destroys the ordinary ways of life. Hey, Rolanda, the, excuse me, Rolanda, can you, uh, the, the PowerPoint, can you present it uh, in the mode, uh, expand it uh, on the screen? Sorry to interrupt you. Uh, Oh, sure. So that we can. Now it says that my screen sharing is paused. I'm really uh -huh. sorry. I don't know your screen sharing. Mm -hmm. It's all oh, right now. There you go. Okay. okay. Yeah, I've, I've been teaching on Zoom forever, but <laughs> right now it, it feels like yeah, some ordinary tasks are somehow more difficult uh, than mm -hmm. usually. Thank you. Thank you for uh, alerting me to that. Uh, the failure of traditional visual language, including visual arts, uh, to register the atrocity of war requires artists to inv invent new languages, meanwhile aiming to maintain the ethics when representing victims of war and real human suffering. But what about war unfolding in front of us as a raw event. What about the artists who remain in bomb shelters or became war refugees? Do they have time and concentration to process, to reflect, and even simply produce art as a physical object? How a researcher which friends and relatives on the bomb can remain objective uh, and analytical? And, uh, analytical. Uh, suddenly, uh, the war makes us all equally helpless, almost naked, deprived of words and glued to the stream, uh, screens consuming the media images fully aware of their conventional nature. In this presentation, I want to give overview of the unfiltered multitude of responses by the Ukrainian artists to the war, given preferences to the topics they raise themselves uh, through their media platforms. Among the mod modes of responses are comic strips, verbal and visual diaries, statements on war and more traditional drawings and collages. Among the themes most pertinent for the artists were the, the commentation of war's impact on, on their lives, regist registering the everyday and the ruinous impact of war, war on it. Uh, for some, uh, it was the declaration of the impossibility to conduct artistic activities and transition to other more urgent tasks. Uh, like neighbor, neighboring watch, volunteer work, or raising awareness about the war and war propaganda through their social media. A very strong current um, in uh, all those responses is a call for decolonization of the so-called great Russian culture and witnessing a failure of communication with Russian colleagues remaining blind to their privileged perspectives and declining to accept any compl complicity with the Russian imperial narrative and insisting on sharing the victimhood with uh, the Ukrainians. So let me start uh, uh, with this uh, comic strips, which actually appeared before the war. And um, it came to many of us mean, included as a shock. Uh, like uh, two days before it started, I was uh, telling my students in a class that uh, Putin was obviously bluffing. And um, we were discussing this comic strip uh, post, uh, posted on uh, a Zabar Zabarona website in Ukraine. And um, it's by Zhenia Ol Olinik, and I'm just showing you some uh, like uh, selected slides from it. I'm watching TV and being pissed with the weather, then I remember, so what's up with Russia? Nothing's going on. Anxiety makes you myopic. Haven't escalated yet. It's like one day actually before the war. They say you need a plan, an emergency grab bag, um, but also thousands of Ukrainians have already run uh, from the war or lived with it. I can't imagine what I do and where I run. Uh, so uh, this image is, uh, and it's a very strong comic strip. I really recommend you checking uh, upon it. 
um, it really uh, demonstrates um, very poignantly the anxiety um, in which uh, many um, artists uh, found themselves uh, while living in Ukraine um, uh, when all these um, uh, messages about impending war started to dominate uh, the media. Um, also, uh, one image uh, which became uh, very widely spread as the war started, even though uh, it um, and also was made before the war. It's by Katerina Lisovenko, who is currently a refugee with her children in Poland. And uh, uh, she uh, subverts this um, uh, popular figure of uh, motherland uh, in traditional uh, antique garment, uh, also a mixture of uh, some kind of antique goddess and Madonna, obviously, but. Uh, 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 both mother and the child are defiantly uh, uh, refusing to accept their fate. And uh, however, the dark ba background implies that um, they are basically in the middle of the storm. Um, and some artists uh, like uh, Mikhailo Alexeyenko here, uh, who is actually uh, both artist and curator who has founded uh, um, a very um, like underground place in uh, the district of Trajeshin of, of Kyiv, um, which is a district uh, with bad reputation. Uh, but uh, uh, he was the one who was bringing uh, this most advanced uh, art uh, from the center to the margins, so to speak. So uh, here, uh, he's um, uh, shown um, as re uh, recording his response on what it means to be a, an artist in the time of war. He's shown in a uh, basement uh, or effectively a bomb shelter. And uh, he's saying that his uh, current artistic practice became uh, um, uh, volunteer work and also going around a neighborhood searching for uh, marks uh, of um, uh, artillery uh, shootings, which uh, were left uh, by diversants. Um, uh, 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 I'm sorry if this it's not the right word. Uh, I'm also, uh, as I uh, said in my uh, introduction, so the diary became um, a very powerful artistic tool. And I'm uh, here showing uh, one of the uh, pages of the diary posted by a uh, theorist and uh, also artists from the art collective uh, Geocinema, Asia Bazdereva, uh, who uh, is juxtaposi juxtaposing her reaction uh, to um, the news of uh, friends of friends being killed or um, her own war trauma uh, to a communication she receives uh, from her uh, Russian colleagues who uh, claims that he is horrified uh, by his um, economical prospects uh, being challenged by uh, the sanctions. And uh, uh, she uses a very strong language and uh, her diary was actually popularized in multiple Western media uh, in a call uh, to uh, decolonize uh, this, uh, the Slavic studies uh, in a call uh, to uh, really uh, uh, confront uh, uh, this type of attitude. And, uh, uh, you know, before preparing this presentation, I contacted Asia and um, um, also very much uh, ridden by guilt from my own safety uh, when you are uh, reaching a colleague and a friend who lives in a bomb shelter. It's kind of inevitable. And um, I asked her if she has uh, kind of any message that she wants to deliver. Uh, she, she said that she just cannot uh, really comment, but uh, through her diary, I think she expresses much more and um, uh, 
she's speaking about things that triggers her. And I think uh, uh, this triggers for those Ukrainian artists and intellectuals uh, uh, who are right there experiencing it at first hand are very important to take note of. Um, uh, Anna Zvyagintseva, uh, a very uh, well artist who is uh, familiar and uh, was the topic of war and um, responding to uh, it um, in her sculptures and installations since the war in the Donbass started. Uh, but obviously, being uh, primarily an artist who is working with monumental forms, uh, uh, she cannot produce the immediate uh, response, but uh, she was very active on social media uh, and um, uh, including exposing um, uh, her attempt to communicate with her former um uh, like russian collaborators colleagues uh, with whom she worked uh, uh, and uh, here uh, she uh, published this uh, um the the catalog from that uh, collaboration about which she said she currently uh, regrets but um uh, she um posted a plea uh, that uh, she uh, has written to her colleagues uh, about uh, how uh, she has never heard from any any one of them in regard to this situation and how she feels appalled by it. Uh, Nikita Kadan, uh, Ukrainian artist uh, who is also working with um, installation and uh, institutional critique, uh, was uh, remaining in Kyiv. Uh, he uh, used this form as postcards from Kyiv, uh, sometimes using this um, old archival imagery uh, to, um, uh, to speak about current events, like when uh, Babin Yar uh, was bombed, um, and, she, and he said that Russia bombed Babin Yar today. And uh, one of the first uh, reaction was from a very a famous uh, a Russian art critic, Yekaterina Dyogach, who has uh, come into the comments and uh, corrected uh, Kadan and said that it was not Russia who bombed, but Putin did. And uh, uh, as you see here from the comments, uh, it, uh, this response uh, infuriated greatly many of the Ukrainian visitors of Nikita Kadan's page. Meanwhile, the war uh, uh, erupted uh, um, and uh, Taras Shevchenko uh, birthday happened. Uh, it was the time when Taras Shevchenko uh, award was announced. And it turned out that Nikita Kadan was one of the artists in visual art who received uh, this um, award for his uh, exhibition, Stone Hits Stone, uh, from the Pinchuk Art Center. I post the, uh, the photograph and he announced that he will, uh, should he receive uh, um, this uh, uh, money for uh, award, he will donate it to the volunteer organization currently helping elderly people in Kyiv. Tiberi uh, Silvashi, actually, the one who, the artist who shared. Uh, this prize uh, in visual arts, uh, Tarashevchenko Prize. Uh, he also is in Kyiv and uh, uh, he uh, regularly, basically every day, and it's such a relief to see his post on Facebook. He just publishes uh, images from uh, his window and uh, he comments them like we are alive. Uh, yeah, th this is his installation which uh, was awarded with Shevchenko Prize. Um, Yevgenia Belarusic is a photographer who also uh, publishes uh, a very uh, uh, fascinating uh, diary where she both tries to uh, document uh, um, uh, visually and um, as she writes her impressions of war. And I really find uh, this citation very important to what we are discussing here. Wherever I look 
everywhere I see war, it has become a total all-encompassing way of life that swallows everything. Um, Lena, I'm sorry, could you wrap up because we need to get to the other speakers, please? Yes, yes, absolutely. So uh, <clears throat> many of such diary entries like Bayers and Savadov, Aleftina Kahidza, who basically spends most of her time in her uh, bomb shelter, uh, in her basement, which turned into a bomb shelter. She comments um, in her very um, uh, like special artistic style. Uh, and um, as you see, Russia, um, Russian academic or intellectual silence really bothers her. Um, and propaganda as well. Um, so some uh, like Putin in an uh, image of cockroach. Uh, she also comments on a great Russian culture. Um, artist from Odessa, Igor Gusev, uh, uh, comments on the effect or effects of propaganda. And uh, uh, he also implies the reference to uh, the uh, great uh, Russian uh, well-known um, uh, artworks like to Ivan Ivazovsky Ninth Wave. Uh, he comments about this recent uh, propaganda claims that Russia, uh, that, he, that there is a biological weapon in Ukraine, and he does it with a very characteristic Odessa humor. And uh, uh, so, um, um, yeah, I'm, I'm just, uh, I do have to wrap up and um, uh, and I really wanted to uh, leave this presentation with uh, this call uh, to reconsider how we uh, are teaching and thinking about um, the um, so-called Slavic studies in general and um, be very much aware uh, of how greatly it's been uh, changed right now. Uh, thank you and um, sorry for um, uh, taking too much time. Thank you, Olena. Um, our next speaker, Yuri Shuchuk, is lecturer of Ukrainian at Columbia University in the city of New York since 2004 and a leading specialist in Ukrainian English lexicography. Um, he has also taught Ukrainian uh, Harvard Summer School. His published translations include George Orwell's Animal Farm and Otis Pteny's best-selling Ukrainian history. He authored Beginner's Ukrainian with Interactive Online Workbook, recently Ukrainian English Collocation Dictionary, and he is also the director of the Ukrainian uh, Film Club at Columbia University, and he's gonna tell us a bit about Ukrainian film right now. Yuri. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, well, I'm going to be uh, talking about the reaction of uh, Ukrainian filmmakers towards what's going on. And uh, I would uh, make this kind of, uh, or uh, ask you to look at uh, uh, this in the context uh, of uh, the war that uh, never really ended. The war uh, simply morphed from one form to another. And uh, what was important for me uh, was that how Ukrainians became increasingly aware that their culture, because I, I talk of the war not only in terms of military adventures and uh, physical destruction of Ukrainians as a nation, but also as a, a continuous war on Ukrainian culture in its very many manifestations. And to me, what was important was that how Ukrainian society increasingly became aware that they are under attack from the from Russian imperial culture, uh, their language, their literature, their uh, capacity to generate their own narratives that are their own, that are free, increasingly free from Russian uh, optics of what it means to be Ukrainian, and how, uh, for instance, what erupted in 2014 as an open uh, uh, the aggression, military aggression, uh, first in Crimea and then in uh, Donbass, provoked Ukrainians into this major revision of uh, what is going on in cultural terms between Russian uh, as uh, the colonizer and Ukraine, Ukraine as still very much colonized culturally. So at that time, Ukrainian filmmakers uh, uh, reacted to the aggression the way they were 
capable of reacting, basically following the impulse of taking their cameras and documenting what was going on in Donbass, in the Crimea, and uh, making uh, Ukrainian uh, uh, films and the Ukrainian narratives of that. Uh, the difference now, uh, when Russia unleashed uh, an all-out war everywhere, is that that form of a reaction is became all but impossible. Uh, and so to make films now became impossible. I have been uh, in contact with a number of Ukrainian filmmakers since the very, very outbreak of this all-out war. And uh, uh, what the, the, the kind of forms of in which Ukrainian filmmaking community and individual Ukrainian filmmakers reacted uh, was number one at the institutional level. There were appeals by all kinds of Ukrainian uh, uh, professional filmmaking institutions, uh, associations and organizations to the world to uh, ban Russia, to isolate Russian, uh, Russian propaganda as it is translated through film uh, from the international uh, organizations to uh, uh, put an end to the participation of Russian filmmakers in all manner of international film festivals, uh, to uh, expel Russians from uh, uh, European organizations like European associations, the producers uh, of commercial uh, cinema, European association of audiovisual producers from, from uh, Euro image, uh, and uh, a number of others to uh, strip of the international accreditation, uh, uh, Moscow International Film Festival, headed by one of the most uh, uh, militant uh, uh, supporters of Putin, Nikita Mikhailkov. Uh, there was also uh, a kind of uh, uh, the, the, the form of institutional uh, reaction towards what's going on was uh, the uh, uh, kind of opening up of uh, Ukrainian government uh, ministry, uh, that is uh, the agency for cinematography, to the opportunities of uh, instrumentalizing Ukrainian film as a focus of international solidarity. Uh, and uh, for instance, uh, as a director of the Ukrainian as, uh, Film Club at Columbia University, I uh, personally experienced this kind of uh, sea change uh, in the policy that now I don't have to, to ask twice uh, Ukrainian uh, producers or filmmakers to uh, make their films available uh, for fundraising uh, uh, events. Uh, organized around the screening and the discussion of such films. For instance, this coming Sunday, there will be one such major fundraising event in Salem, Massachusetts. That's literally um, a suburb of Boston. But the wonderful thing about it is that there, were, uh, the, uh, there are, we are going to be screening together with the local art house cinema, uh, uh, Ole Sanyan's uh, The Guide, uh, the response of the local community was such that they are expanding it into the second uh, uh, viewing uh, uh, auditorium because the first one couldn't accommodate everybody. But the screening is going to be attended by the governor of the state of Massachusetts. Uh, um, uh, local members of the US uh, Congress and uh, the mayor of, of, the, of the city of Salem. And that's only the beginning because there's now, the wave is, is going on. And, uh, and I have a, a, a cooperation with uh, uh, Ukrainian filmmakers. Uh, I lined uh, a number of almost uh, 10 Ukrainian films ready to go. Uh, and uh, there, there will be uh, already a screening in Brooklyn. There will be a series of uh, weekly screenings at the Ukrainian Institute of America. What is important for me is this reaction of Ukrainian community, however curtailed and limited by, by the onslaught. Because, for instance, Ole Sanyan recorded his address 
to the screen to the uh, to the viewers of the screening in Boston from a dungeon. Uh, he he uh, 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 Antonio Lukic, uh, a very promising young talented Ukrainian film director, famous for his film My Thoughts Are, Are Quiet, um, had to flee Kiev, leaving behind almost finished. The next film of his called Luxembourg because he didn't have space in his car uh, because uh, he had to choose between his family and, and his uh, film stock that was already there. So he left it behind, uh, praying that it doesn't perish. Uh, so it's, the situation is really dire. But what is important for me in all this uh, that is happening uh, vis-a-vis uh, concerning the Ukrainian filmmaking community is this uh, very quick realization that the so-called quote-unquote great Russian filmmaking tradition and great Russian culture uh, in general are increasingly viewed as tools of Russian imperialism. And that uh, finally, what I have been uh, talking about for decades uh, uh, when I screened the uh, Ukrainian films uh, becomes sinking very quickly into Ukrainian uh, filmmaking community consciousness and uh, appreciation of what's going on and uh, obviously will be influencing their films because uh, uh, the last point, I have two minutes left, uh, and I like to be disciplined. The last point I want to make that uh, even despite the fact uh, of the brutal war being waged on Ukrainians, Ukrainian response is still very much uh, beholden to Russian uh, ideology and to Russian narrative. What I mean by that, for instance, there were calls by some very influential intellectuals to verbalize in a new way this war. And the, propo and the, uh, the proposition was, we need to call this the patriotic war. So basically borrowing a Russian uh, meme, the meme of Russian imperial uh, historiography and uh, trying to kind of pretend that it has no ideological luggage and use it to verbalize uh, Ukrainian experience today. Uh, the Ukrainian president Zelensky also uh, doing uh, literally uh, the same or acting uh, communicatively acting in a similar way says that he's going to award uh, cities that are heroically fending off Russian onslaught the title of city hero, which is yet another Soviet meme and uh, another. So uh, I think we also have to find a really new language in which, uh, which we deploy to verbalize this experience, because this is uh, this, what we are experiencing now, hopefully, is the ultimate stage of Ukrainian decolonization at all levels, not only, uh, but what's important to me at the deep level of, of how we verbalize and how we look at our experiences today and how we uh, kind of uh, deploy film uh, as a reflection of this experience not simply a reflection, a mirror that reflects, but to borrow Nietzsche's uh, uh, definition of art, uh, of art as mirror that transforms. And this uh, uh, kind of uh, function of filmmaking art as transformative art is being rediscovered very unequally by various representatives of Ukrainian uh, filmmaking community uh, with various degree of success. I'll stop here. Thank you, Yuri. Um, our next speaker and I will uh, shorten the biography uh, a bit in the interest of time, but uh, you'll be able to read their biographies on, on our website. Our next speaker is Maria Sonovetska, she's Associate Professor of Anthropology and Music at Bard College, 
Her research focuses on post-Soviet Ukraine, where she has pursued interests including folklore revivals after state socialism, and the effects of the Chernobyl nuclear disaster on the revival of rural musical repertoires. In 2011, to commemorate the 20th anniversary of the Chernobyl nuclear catastrophe, she founded the Chernobyl Song Project, Living Culture from a Lost World. She's author of Wild Music, Sound and Sovereignty in Ukraine, uh, and has published articles in Music and Politics, Public Culture, The World of Music, and Journal of Popular Music Studies. Uh, Please, Maria. Thank you, Yaku. Hello, everybody. Thanks to everyone who's here. Um, my heart is with all of you, with everyone I love, and I feel pain at the distance uh, between me and those people that I love in Ukraine. Carly, I'm going to go ahead and drop the links that we talked about myself. So I'm just going to drop some links. We're going to talk about musicians responding to war. The truth is, musicians are, of course, responding in all kinds of different ways um, at, at the moment. And so those links can allow you to see some examples. Um, I wanted to invoke the often cited um, quotation by Leonard Bernstein, who was the son of Ukrainian Jewish immigrants to the United States. His mother was born in Khmelnytsky, his father in Rivne, and he famously said, quote, this will be our reply to violence to make music more intensely, more beautifully, more devotedly than ever before, end quote. Bernstein uttered these words after the assassination of John F. Kennedy Jr. in 1963, before a New York Philharmonic young pe person's concert, young people's concert. But we can see also today Ukrainian musicians responding in this way, intensely, beautifully, devotedly, seriously, and also sometimes humorously. So I want to, in this 10 minute window, give us two quick examples, um, and then I will look forward to questions. So the first example I've talked about a lot recently and I've written about extensively, so I will try to make this short. Um, this is um, Jamala, a Crimean Tatar singer um, who was displaced after 2014. So an, an, another reminder that this war began eight years ago, if not as Dr. Shevchuk was just suggesting centuries ago. Um, Jamala has now fled from Ukraine with her child. Her husband, who is also Crimean Tatar, has remained in Kyiv and is serving in the Ter Oborona. So this, um, this singer rose to great prominence in uh, 2016 internationally when she won the Eurovision Song Contest, which is an annual pageant of kind of kitsch and geopolitics, although I'm going to suggest the song we're about to hear is not kitschy. She won with a song called 1944. 1944, as many people in the audience likely know, was the year in which Stalin um, deported the entire population of Crimean Tatars from the Crimean Peninsula, resettling them primarily in Central Asia um, under what was then called a humanitarian resettlement that uh, resulted in what is estimated to be a likely two thirds of the population of Crimean Tatars perishing on the journey. So they consider it a genocide. Um, Jamala's song called 1944 was chosen to represent Ukraine at Eurovision in 2016. So this song about a Stalinist deportation is performed two years after the occupation of Crimea by, the, by Putin's Russia. Um, this is also a reminder that whenever we think about this discourse of Russian spaces, the need to protect Russians in these spaces, that these spaces have a history, a history of settler colonialism, akin to the histories of settler colonialism in North America. Um, so I want to just play a little bit of this performance, and I'm not going to play the whole thing in the interest of time, but it's easy to find on the internet. This performance uh, was done last weekend in Germany at the Eurovision um, finals for that competition. It reportedly raised seven, 67 million euros for um, military defense in Ukraine. And before I play it, I just want to assert a fo the following things. So Jamala is, as I mentioned, Crimean Tatar, representing Ukraine. The song references two Crimean Tatar songs. One is E Guzel Kurum, which means, Oh, My Beautiful Crimea, which is a famous protest song from the 1960s. The other song referenced obliquely is Arafat Dahe, which is a traditional Crimean Tatar song thought to be from the period of the Crimean Khanate, when Crimean Tatars were the dominant population of the peninsula, so before 1783. Um, to represent Ukraine at the Eurovision Song Contest with a song about the Stalinist deportation of Crimean Tatars was symbolically charged already in 2016. In 2022, it takes on a new level of meaning 
now advocating not only for the sovereignty of Crimea and the dignity of Crimean Tatar people, but also for the whole of Ukraine. So I just want to listen to a little bit of this together. I'm hoping my internet cooperates. to stop the song there for now, but I, I encourage people to listen to the rest. The chorus is taken directly from the song E Guzel Kurum, which again mar was um, a protest song associated with the human rights campaign Crimean Tatars launched in the late 1960s to agitate for the right to return to Crimea. The song basically talks about longing to go home. It's especially poignant in this moment. When she announced this performance on Instagram, Jamala wrote, quote, I am grateful to all of those who support our fight for the right to live at home, to build the future under a peaceful sky, end quote. This kind of a musical example begs the question of what exactly is being articulated here. Russian propaganda would suggest that Ukraine must be denazified, that there's a project of a xenophobic kind of ethno-nationalist project inside of Ukraine. We can reject this as a flat lie. And I want to suggest that these kinds of tenuous, what I think of as post-colonial solidarities between the predominantly Sunni Muslim Crimean Tatar community of indigenous people and ethnic Ukrainians and all kinds of other groups within the space, the territory of Ukraine gives the lie immediately, right? Um, I will say also, I was just an hour ago texting with um, a colleague and a teacher and someone I tre tremendously respect and love really, who's today in Kyiv. And he, I asked him what he wanted me to say. He said, please close the sky. So that is the message that I received from a very prominent Ukrainian musician today. Um, because I don't wanna dwell only in darkness and gloom, I'll also just quickly call our attention to this viral phenomenon recently, which is a kind of comedic song about Turkish made drones that apparently have been having great success in taking out uh, Russian equipment by Rakhtar. So we'll listen to a little bit of this. You can also easily find this on YouTube. <laughs> Прийшли окупанти до нас в Україну, форма новенька, воєнні машини, та трохи поплавився їх інвентар. Байрактар. Байрактар. Сайл, стоп і гер, also. I don't mean to glorify violence, of course, and I myself and my pacifist heart is challenged by this moment, but I do think we need to be equipping Ukrainians to be able to fight this incredibly unfair fight. Um, and so Ukrainians are finding ways to find light and humor despite the violence that they're forced right now to choose. Um, the last thing I will say, and I think I'm still within my, yes, I still have a minute and 10 seconds, um, is that I was also contacted by musicians in Lviv the other day. And I'm going to say that this is controversial. I had to really think about how to argue for my own position here. But there's a community of classical musicians in uh, Ukraine who feel that it is deeply unfair that international music competitions today are going to continue to include Russian performers. 
when Ukrainian performers are effectively excluded, because as you know, men between the ages of 18 and 60 are not allowed to leave the country, and women are busy defending their lives and their families, um, if not serving, in fact, as well. So this de facto exclusion of Ukrainians when Russians continue to be able to be ambassadors to the world of musical culture is something that is deeply troubling to Ukrainian musicians. And this petition, which is in the links that I just um, sent out at the beginning, is something you might consider supporting. Um, again, I acknowledge the controversial nature of that, taking this position, but these are extreme times. And I think we are forced to make a choice I am choosing to align myself also with Ukrainian musicians in this moment. I'm going to leave it there. Um, I look forward to the questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Maria. And yes, please uh, look at uh, useful links that we have um, in the chat. Uh, several of our participants have posted in there about various resources and more information about the topic we're discussing. Uh, our final speaker is Kate Surkan, who is a writer, editor, and translator in 2017. Uh, she co-founded Apophony Magazine, an online journal that publishes mostly Central Eastern European literature in translation. She's a PhD candidate at NYU, specializing in 19th century science fiction, and she's coming to us today from Chernivtsi, Ukraine. Uh, Kate, please. Thank you. Uh, and I think uh, not only Maria, but the whole audience would like to hear that this Bayraktar song actually plays on the news here in Ukraine uh, in between news breaks. So it's um, uh, being accompanied also by various performances of the national anthem uh, as well. Uh, so yeah, I am in Chernivtsi. I hope that air raid sirens don't go off. They have uh, sometimes at inconvenient moments. And um, even though uh, Chernivtsi has not seen the violence that uh, Kherson or Kharkiv or Kiev has seen, uh, I can say just for our listeners to understand that we also feel the war very acutely here. We have over 20,000 refugees uh, living in Chernivtsi right now. And that's just according uh, no, to those who, who registered with local authorities. Um, my husband actually went to a funeral the other day. His classmate was killed in the fighting in Kherson. So it's uh, becoming the situation where the longer this war goes on, the more it touches everyone on a personal level, unfortunately. Uh, when it comes to literature, that is also the case. Uh, since 2014, some 200 plus books about the war have been written uh, in all genres. This includes uh, fiction, poetry, uh, journalistic dispatches, uh, poetry, and uh, quite a few of them are starting to get translated into English. Uh, recently, uh, Luba Yakimchuk's uh, poetry collection, Apricots of Donbass, was uh, released by Lost Horse Press. Uh, she is a poet from Luhansk region, uh, and she writes rather eloquently about, uh, about the situation. Also, uh, Serhi Zhidan's The Orphanage, which is a work of fiction uh, about an apolitical man who is forced to become political when uh, Donbass is invaded. And he has to rescue his nephew from the conflict zone. Um, in terms of nonfiction, Artem Chekh, he is a Ukrainian writer who enlisted in the army in 2015. Uh, he wrote a diary. It was a, originally starting out as Facebook posts, and he transformed it later into a book uh, called Absolute Zero, which was translated by Oksana Lutsitschina, another Ukrainian writer who lives and works in the United States, and Olena Jennings, Ukrainian-American poet. Uh, so, yeah, this is to say that a lot of work has been uh, published, has been written, is still being written. Uh, right now, a lot of Ukrainian authors have uh, joined Territorial Defense Force. Uh, for example, uh, and what I think most notably, uh, writers like Stanislav Vaseyev, who was um, uh, kidnapped uh, in Donetsk and uh, imprisoned in Izolatia for two and a half years, which is, uh, for those who don't know, uh, this rather notorious prison in occupied Donetsk, where a lot of innocent Ukrainians uh, are um, tortured physically, psychologically, women are brutally raped by the guards. This uh, prison is still operating uh, today. And uh, Seyev was there until he was released in a prisoner exchange. Now he is in Kyiv. And uh, when the war started, he uh, evacuated his mother to safety in the West and returned to join territorial force. Uh, likewise, uh, Oleg Sansov, another very famous uh, prisoner uh, of war, he was arrested for annexation of his native Crimea, and he spent uh, five years in the Russian penal colony. And um, 
uh, he almost died on the hunger strike in 2018 that captured the attention of the entire world. Uh, so yeah, he is also in territorial defense. Uh, but it's not only writers who have uh, been affected on a very personal level. Uh, Artem Chupai, he is a writer from Kolomia. He uh, is very, uh, he is a self-described pacifist, but he also enlisted in territorial uh, defense and um, he is also serving. So uh, a lot of writers are in this situation right now, but uh, those who are not fighting uh, have stayed behind to join volunteer efforts. Uh, for example, uh, here in Chernivtsi, uh, Andriy Lupka was here eventually uh, for a while, uh, and he was trying to find um, places for refugees, not just in Chernivtsi, but Lviv and Zakarpatia regions. Uh, Christian van Rinuk, a poet from Chernivtsi, has been doing phenomenal work to find supplies for soldiers, to find housing for refugees. And she is nine months pregnant, by the way. So she is doing this under incredible physical duress. Uh, so I, I can say that Ukrainian writers have been doing an incredible amount of activism, uh, of defense of the nation right now. Uh, of course, uh, we should also mention Serhi Zhadan. He has been in Kharkiv this whole time. Uh, and if you want to get a really interesting perspective uh, on what's going on in Kharkiv, I advise all of you to read his Facebook. He's updating regularly. Uh, recently, he made a photo, a post that uh, the Budinok Slovo was destroyed uh, by Russian shelling. Uh, for those who don't know, Budinok Slovo was a house in the 1930s where a lot of Ukrainian writers lived. Uh, during this time, uh, Kharkiv was the capital of Soviet Ukraine, and uh, anyone who wanted to make it big was heading to Kharkiv. Uh, but unfortunately, in these times of Stalinist purges, most uh, an alarming number of the artists who lived in Budinok Slovo were arrested uh, and many executed by NKVD. So this entire generation of Ukrainian writers came to be known as the executed renaissance uh, for, for the scale of death that occurred in their ranks. Uh, so the fact that uh, Budinok Slovo was destroyed is just another example that uh, uh, Russia is actively trying to uh, attack Ukrainian culture during this time. They talk about Russian speakers, but Kharkiv uh, is a predominantly Russian-speaking city and it is facing some of the worst uh, violence since the war began. Uh, so writers like uh, Shedan, who call Kharkiv home, have been doing an incredible amount of work to help people there at risk of their own safety, no less. Uh, I would like to mention also one Ukrainian writer who has been serving in the armed forces. Uh, she's less known than the authors I mentioned, but it's nonetheless extremely important. Uh, her name is Yarina Chornohus. She is from a family of poets in Kyiv. Her father and grandfather were also writers. And uh, she uh, started as a volunteer medic. Right now she's serving in the Marines and she was the first woman to join her combat battalion. Uh, and she has been also updating regularly from the front lines. And uh, I would like to uh, read a poem of hers that I translated uh, today. So yeah, it's called, If You and I Will Survive. If you and I will survive, then we will live on the land where the loss of each breath, quite, sorry, I'm so sorry. I, it's a, a different stanza. Um, if you and I survive, I will try for the first time in my life to grow plants in an unmined field with the hands of a person from the city who only with the advent of war saw what is hiding under the asphalt. If you and I survive, then we will live on the land where the loss of each breath before our eyes. The past unfolds invisible and sharp. The moon will turn blue and buzz in our ears. Every winter, I will be unstitched by the ice on the mountains and steps with crooked maps. And there will be no sliver of romance in it that disappeared long ago in peaceful lands, along with heroism, leaving me your sudden presence, gray and passionate. We will invite death to warm with us by the fire. She will beat us with her wooden sticks and we will rub her dead hands. If you and I survive, I will not endure so painfully the harsh spring light which wounds me. It will definitely come on after that winter. I can't forget. Winters are not forgotten in this country. So yes, um, this is an incredible young poet uh, that I think we pay attention to uh, as the war continues, but also after the war ends. 
Uh, one last thing I would like to mention uh, is that uh, since the war started in 2014, uh, we see an increasing number of uh, we see an increasing number of writers who have made the switch from writing in uh, Russian to writing in Ukrainian. Uh, most notably Volodymyr Rafayenko, which Mark uh, translated uh, his book Montegrin, which will be published uh, very soon uh, by Harvard University Press. And uh, Volodymyr right now, uh, Lubko Daresh, another writer, posted on Facebook that uh, Volodymyr is in this Bucha region, which is under heavy onslaught in Kyiv. So it's a little hard to uh, get updates from him. And we're all hoping that he is OK and that everything will be fine. Uh, so he he made uh, famously the switch from writing in Ukrainian or from Russian to Ukrainian. Uh, Olena Stiashkina also uh, made this switch, and uh, a, a lot of writers who have always been writing in uh, in Ukrainian are actively supporting them, and there is a great amount of solidarity uh, in this. Uh, we have uh, been trying to publish a lot of these writers in English translation since the war started. Uh, two weeks ago, I and some other translators have been uh, reaching out to, to Western presses. We have gotten Olena Stiashkina in Gernika. Uh, we got uh, Ostap Ukraine, it's a young writer from Ivano Frankivsk, published in the LA Review of Books. Uh, today, Christian van Rinuk's poetry was published in uh, Gernika. And uh, Miroslav Layuk, uh, a young writer uh, who is from Kosiv, uh, he wrote about this executed renaissance for Literary Hub. Uh, so yes, all of this is to say that a lot of uh, work is being done by Ukrainian writers and their translators to uh, elevate the perspective on the ground during this time. And uh, even those who, who cannot write are picking up guns to fight. So. Uh, yeah, my, my thoughts, uh, excuse me, are a, a bit jumbled because uh, I am living here on the grounds and uh, you know, dealing with this situation directly. But I, I hope I've conveyed that I'm extremely proud of all of these writers and they're a huge inspiration, each and every one of them. So, yeah. Thank you very much, Kate. Um, I do want to get some questions in. So for people listening, if you want to pose questions, please do that in the Q&A tab and I will read that. We, we can go a little bit over one o'clock uh, if, if, if need be. Uh, uh, yeah, it's interesting, uh, Kate, what you just said, you know, almost uh, I know you've noticed this and in, in, in the field of literature, there's been being contacted constantly now by by the West, interested in these publishing these these authors and talking about Ukrainian literature, uh, it, it's just very sudden, and and a lot of them are very a lot of people are surprised that there's actually been translations done, and that there are people that can speak knowledge, you know, about this. Um, almost everybody that you mentioned uh, has been at Harriman. Uh, a save was supposed to be at Harriman in two weeks. Uh, Volodya Rafayanko was supposed to be at Harriman in, in, in April, and they will come and we'll do it. Uh, but my question is to the, uh, to the other panelists, has, has film, visual art, uh, and music, a Ukrainian, have you noticed in, in your, have you been contacted more, uh, exponentially more like, like people that work in literature have? Uh, so, uh, I mean, maybe Olena, Yuri, Maria, do you have any comments on that? Yes, definitely. Uh, right now, there is uh, um, this call uh, for arms, so to speak, among uh, those of us who uh, study Ukrainian culture professionally and uh, have been contacted uh, by, uh, by many uh, people and organizations. And uh, despite being overwhelmed, we are all trying to uh, do our best to expose um, uh, the importance of the Ukrainian culture. Uh, right now, I have a, an exhibition open in the Simerly Art Museum on Ukrainian art. Uh, I have been doing uh, many tours, including uh, fundraising tours with Erasm for Ukraine. We collected uh, $3,500 this Sunday. And uh, uh, each time when I have this opportunity to talk, I I say that uh, Ukrainian culture exists and it matters, and we have to uh, really uh, use this um, decolonizing lens to uh, look at it and um, really change uh, our uh, perspective uh, given this atrocious uh, events. Thank you. Yuri? 
or Maria? Uh, uh, I was uh, I was contacted uh, very actively, uh, particularly compared to to before the Russian onslaught by uh, people who were not part of the usual suspects interested in Ukrainian film. Uh, they want uh, Ukrainian film to be uh, screened uh, uh, in their in their own venues, uh, including today after my just very brief remark, uh, phone call to National Public Radio's program, uh, uh, Brian Lehrer, uh, when I where I spoke about uh, using film as a tool of solidarity of garnering solidarity. Uh, on the part of a uh, larger American public, I, I got uh, a message from uh, an owner of a, of a private uh, uh, the cultural institution that he wanted to, to screen a Ukrainian film. And I anticipate that this is going to be growing and uh, we are preparing ourselves uh, for that uh, by stocking our, our collection of films uh, with uh, films that were not shown. Uh, there was uh, going to be a retrospective of uh, Valentin Vasyanovich at the Museum of Moving Image, but uh, they still, uh, they haven't yet announced it, so I'm telling you about this in secret, uh, uh, but uh, uh, the very fact that they wanted that, uh, screening all of his films, and he is now one of the most celebrated Ukrainian filmmakers, already says something. There's, there's a qualitative change in the visibility of Ukrainian culture here in this country. Uh, and we can, we can feel it. Uh, it's, of course, uh, it's, it's a shame that uh, it had to take uh, the, the, the brutal aggression of, of, of Russia uh, to affect that, but it is happening. Yeah, and I, I think I read somewhere that the film movement uh, has just bought rights to three films for distribution in North America, including uh, Irina Selik's film, uh, which she showed with the Ukrainian Film Club a couple of years ago. So uh, what audiences in North America are going to be able to go to a movie theater or, or, or get it, you know, in, in their usual ways. Uh, so that's wonderful news. Uh, um, Maria, please. Um, yeah, so I think it's, yes, there's greater interest right now in this moment of war. I wish it didn't have to be this way, right? Um, the reality is so many Ukrainian musicians cannot leave right now. Dacha Bracha is not able to tour in North America at the moment because one of their members is serving in the territorial defense. Um, I know a lot of Ukrainian musicians who are outside of Ukraine are doing everything they can think of do. Uh, benefit concerts are happening all the time. Yesterday, New York had a huge benefit concert organized by Eugene Hutz, who's, of course, originally from Kyiv, came of age in the late Soviet Kyiv underground rock scene, has great stories from that time, and is now internationally known as the lead singer of Gogol Bordello. He had, like, Stephen Merritt and Patti Smith singing the national anthem with him on stage yesterday. We're seeing these kinds of acts of solidarity through music everywhere right now but it doesn't change the conditions for average Ukrainian musicians and especially not famous Ukrainian musicians. So on my list um, that I, on my list, I had in, included an article that came out in Spin Magazine a few days ago that my husband actually wrote, so nepotism, but he um, is very plugged into the kind of indie scene, not famous musicians, young, not famous musicians, basically. And you can get a sense there of what it's like to not be a celebrity musician and what, it, what the kinds of choices they're facing. Um, I'll also, not to answer your question, but I'll also just say that in New York, I hope people are aware that the contemporary, Ukrainian Contemporary Music Festival is coming up. I just dropped the link for that. Uh, I believe it's happening this, this coming week. So I hope if you are in New York, some of you might be able to attend and support that event as well. Thank you. And thank you for mentioning uh, that wonderful uh, festival. Uh, well, I want to get one question in before we have to break up. This is <clears throat> from one of our students, uh, Daniel Brennan. He asks Professor Shevchuk, uh, how do you interpret non-Ukrainian efforts to document the war through film, notably Sean Penn's uh, documentary that we've all heard about? Uh, I, I can only welcome such efforts. 
uh, I worked with uh, Sean Penn's uh, t- t- film crew uh, as they when they started uh, visiting Ukraine with the intention of uh, filming what's what was going on. I was in 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 close contact with his with, with his uh, manager uh, and uh, advised them for certain things. I hope. Uh, Sean Penn's uh, interest in Ukraine will snowball into a greater visibility uh, of Ukraine for the celebrity community. We know that we live in the age of celebrity culture, and I cannot state enough how important it is to uh, kind of uh, take advantage of their uh, symbolic capital and their prestige to make the Ukrainian cause the cause of the entire free world. Uh, it should be said that uh, a certain segment of American, of Hollywood uh, community is uh, still very much Russia oriented. I remember after uh, the Russian invasion of the Crimea, I approached Spike Lee with the request uh, to comment. And he said, I have nothing to say on two occasions. Uh, I approached uh, Susan Sarandon also with with such a request, and uh, she told me we don't have full information yet. Uh, I have nothing to say. So that has to be also taken into account. Um, but uh, what Sean Penn does is really admirable. Yes, thank you very much. Um... I think we will wrap up now because we are out of time. I, I I want to thank all of you. I know you're very busy, and 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 Kate for also from Ukraine and here in North America for for your for your wonderful insight. And please do look at uh, the links that are in the chat. There's lots of great uh, information there, resources, and and I just want to call all our listeners and who's going to be watching this later on YouTube. Um, you know, support Ukraine culture, support these people that are. In, in threat right now uh, in Ukraine. Uh, they're very talented. Uh, their works are accessible through various means like we saw, uh, it, we see in the chat, support them. Uh, if you really wanna learn what's happening in Ukraine, you can really learn it. It's done with wit, it's done with style, it's done with grace in very, very different forms. So I'm sure you'll find something there and that'll maybe help you uh, get through these days and, and understand what's happening. So thank you everybody for tuning in and for participating. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.